Hello, thank you for that. I'm just going to dive in and uh, get going here. So uh, th what the session's obviously about, checklists, and, and uh, I'm going to be sharing some life story that still uh, tugs on some heartstrings. It's not that uh, old of a situation, my mom passing, and my story's a lot about that. So, But I think that we learn a lot from those stories, so that's why I'm going to share that. Um, when we think of checklists, a lot of times there's a negative thought to that right away, like, oh, God, i got to fill out another thing or whatnot. Who would you say checklists are for? Yourself. Okay. What's that? Busy people. Busy people? Well, I like that. It's the first time I've heard that one. Anybody else? Parents. Parents. Okay. Parents. How about people? What? <laughs> right? Well, maybe I have a group in here that really seems to be drawn to checklists or whatnot. Uh, a lot of us think of checklists are for the people that don't do their job or don't do things, and we have to create these as ways to get them to do their job. You, you kind of heard that mentality before? You create a checklist if you're in leadership or management or whatnot to say, people keep forgetting this. How can you forget this? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write it out for you. I'm going to make it really easy, and I'm going to bullet it. And with that attitude, a lot of people that don't need the checklist to do simple tasks like turn the lights off, lock the doors, do certain things at the end of a the day, they get really annoyed with it. And then checklists get to be a bad thing. So what I'm going to try and do is bring some life back into the greatness of checklists uh, through some of these stories and uh, show you how to make one for yourself. So we guys take a look at that handout and I'd kind of like some help if I could just get a volunteer to read on page three this little quote for me. There are a thousand ways things can go wrong. Does that fit anybody's life? Workplace or whatnot? I, I'm telling you, if I could sit here and read this whole book to you, I would. I would enjoy it. I would grasp it. would take us like nine years to get through because the conversation of each one of these quotes would take forever. But uh, this, is, this is the big thing that we, you know, we take for granted is especially... And I'm going to use myself, uh, for example. I tell a little bit more about myself in a bit, but uh, I teach a motorcycle technology program, so we have a lot of different ways things can go wrong. And numerous, way, numerous times when I'm doing something, there's only one way to do it. And people think, oh, there's always multiple ways. Sometimes in our field, there's literally only one way to do it. And when we skip one step, what happens? Work. Disaster, right? Something, something goes wrong. So for me, checklists are really important. And I don't know, they're going to sound a little crazy or whatnot, but when I leave my front door each morning, there's a magnetic notepad on that door that has the things that I need every day. I put a little box by the door that has my keys, my, my absolutely necessity things. Does that make sense? Anybody else with me on that? All right, so we got some checklist people in here. Uh, let's think about students, though. Um, you ever struggle with a student overlooking what seems like simple steps that cost them success? And you know, I think all of us mostly would fall in that category where you're like, wait a second, how'd you, how'd you forget that? That's an easy one. You just, you overlooked this, right? Just that one thing and then it costs them success. And the thing is, if they do that one step, you've got this actual qualified, certified, you know, student that can actually go do that task. But when they skip that one thing, it, in, you know, here's the problem, let's face education uh, for technical. We have to grade an A through an F, right? You with me? The majority of our stuff is not that way in the real world. It's pass or fail. You know, you can't clean teeth partially, am I right? I mean, you do half the mouth, is the customer happy? I know I'm trying to pick, up, you know, pick some people that are in here. I can't build half an engine. It's not possible. I can't put your tire on and not put air in it. I mean, the majority of our stuff is that we need the complete list to be successful. So. Who came to this session because you feel like you desperately need change in what you're doing? Anybody? Couple hands? Maybe one little area, one little thing. It doesn't have to just be work. It could be at home. Maybe you're the person for getting your keys. Maybe you're the person for getting to shut your garage door. Maybe, you know, just these simple tasks. You're laughing out there. Right? Right. So you're the one driving around the block like three times? Yeah. Right. Well, did, well, did I really look at the door? Was it all the way down? You know? Is it sticking up? Okay. Um, you know, I, I want us to focus on this too though, you know, forgetfulness, accountability, and safety prevention in the classroom, those things. I'm a huge, huge, huge advocate for safety. You know, we, a lot of people say they are, and we, you know, we're like, oh yeah, that's what we're doing or whatnot, but I take it, I take it really serious, and the reason I do, and I think that the majority of us can, can agree with this, is that I've ran into situations where someone's been hurt, and we learn so much from that, and we want to prevent that, and we don't want to have those situations. So. 
A uh, little bit about me, this is not a YouTube session. I would love to do an entire session on YouTube. It's my big passion, but uh, um, look at a couple facts here. Because what I want to do is I want to create a couple things. I want to sell myself to you. And I think that it's really important that we know that who we're learning from has experience in that background. This is pretty easy to find out. Uh, I have 2.3 million views, 7,000 subscribers in 190 countries. And the thing about it is that with my YouTube, you would not believe how much my students and I are learning. It is constantly evolving because on my YouTube channel, I'm very, very authentic. The, the people are liking the authentic teaching of it. They're saying, hey, this just isn't a how to take a wheel off. This isn't how to do this. I'm standing up there going, this is how you don't do it. And if you don't do it, this is why. The, the lessons in there are so outside of the field of mechanics. It's life skills. It's accountability. It's integrity. And I'm finding that my audience is really attracted to that. We have a lot of people out there. Anybody heard of a little guy named Mike Rowe? Big guy? Mike Rowe is fantastic, right? He's such an advocate for technical education, technical training. Anybody mind reading that for me? One fan describes as Shane Conley is the new zen and the art of motorcycle mechanics for the millennium. He is relentless in challenging us rethink everything we do. He incorporates life philosophy into every lesson. It is like life church with tools in hand. I never leave a lesson without pondering some reflective thought and trying to answer his thought-provoking questions. This guy completely rewrote the book on the lost value of accountability, safety, and integrity. Please clone him and bring him to our country to teach. This was from the United Kingdom. It's not just about mechanics, it's a whole philosophy. And in that book, they talk about uh, his experience of when he went into a shop and it was crazy and bolts were loose and all this stuff. And then next thing you know, he's talking about his multiple personalities. So I thought this fit me very well. Uh, um, <laughs> so uh, this is why checklists became so important in my life. This is my mom, isn't she pretty? Yeah, she uh, very, very cool gal. Got me into motorcycles actually at a young age. So her, uh, her story here, is she was diagnosed with cancer uh, by fax machine. Uh, the doctor actually sent a fax to her work instead of the doctor office. And uh, so imagine this, you're sitting at your desk and HR comes up to you and slides this piece of paper across to you and says, I did not read this, but this is for you. Okay, so she reads, patient number 12874 has been uh, diagnosed with terminally ill uh, leukemia and some other form of cancer and uh, needs uh, immediate recommendation for chemotherapy and so on and all the treatments and all the stuff that I couldn't read in this document, right? My mom was at day 88 of a 90 day probation at a job. They fired her four hours later. The day before, I'd taken her lunch and her bosses were telling me what a great job she was doing. Oh, your mom's fantastic, she's 30 year bookkeeper. Uh, I mean, everybody loved her. I mean, that's my mom. You know this, right? But I mean, I'm saying that this was, this was my mom. I mean, this was my mom. She was just very authentic and genuine, very well liked. Um, so HR fires her that same afternoon and says, we just decided this position just isn't working out for us. And I think we could kind of guess what that business decision was that was made. Nothing we could do about it. We tried to even look into legal action. And uh, my mom's just like, she was so tired. She, was, she had been battling being sick, but didn't know why. And so she just didn't want to fight it. Um, so we decide, what do you do? You survive, right? You take that next step. So um, she starts the meds to, uh, to treat the cancer, right? Like that's what you do. So it was 2006, uh, 2009 here, she was given six months to live unless she did intense chemo. So you, know, you, you try the first step because you're just trusting the process and this has worked for a lot of people and you go the next step. So she does chemo for seven months. Two thousand, by 2010, she's lost all her hair, her eyesight's down to nothing, she can't drive anymore. And here's a little photo when she lost her hair. There's a place in Spencer, Iowa that's famous for wigs for cancer patients. patients. So we were trying to have some fun that day. Uh, making the best of it. Mom looked a lot better in me than I did, so I guess that's uh, good for her. But it gets worse. As much as I hate to say it, these stories just keep getting worse and worse. Uh, so she was diagnosed with this. Uh, we go to Mayo in 2010, and they tell her, stop chemo, you don't have cancer. You've never had cancer. You've had a liver disease that looks like cancer. Listen to me on this, because I'm, I'm not trying to beat anybody up here. I'm honestly not. There's a test that Sioux City at the time did not have that the Mayo Clinic has. And what they're realizing is a lot of people with this liver disease were just getting told they had cancer because it looked like it. But without this extra tool, 
right? Without this extra tool, without this extra check on a list, it, that's what they did. They just said you had cancer. So the Mayo says, stop chemo. Now you gotta imagine this. This is this little Doogie Hauser guy. I mean, he was like young, he was in his early 30s. He literally looked like Doogie Hauser. if anybody's, you know, my age in here seen that show. And he's got the accent and he's just like, you know, no, you have to quit. You quit the chemo, it's killing you. You don't have it, you don't need it. You have life left in you. You know, we're gonna fight this out. My mom was so like, the chemo's the only thing keeping me alive, right? And, uh, so she trusted it, and uh, Doogie, Mr. Doogie, was phenomenal at getting us into realizing that we should uh, take a look at stopping that. Um, within five months, check this out, my mom was driving again. Okay? Uh, bought her little car, uh, she grew her hair back, she literally got her eyesight back. She got back to a point previous to the chemo. It was just crazy. You know what? My mom didn't blame anybody. She didn't, at that point, she was still like, you know what? This is great, you know, I just, she was so happy to have that freedom. Boy, I mean, to, to lose your freedom to drive, I, I can't even imagine it. So there's really kind of her story of numerous things that happened. But in this, in this process, what was crazy to me and where checklists come into place is how many medical do we have in here? Few? Okay, so you know about these EpiPens, these insulin pins, right? Okay, anybody else? Anybody know about blood sugar levels? You know about blood sugar levels? What? Let's see if this will work. If your blood sugar was that, what would you do? Um, start an IV and get you D50. My mom's blood sugar level the day she passed was 22. Okay, now what that means, if you don't know what that looks like, at about 50 a lot of times they would usually send her to the hospital or if she was 450. So those were the ranges. So when you're high, they give you insulin to bring it back down to a reasonable number. Is 100 or something average, 100, something like that, okay? So we wanna try and be around 100s where our blood sugar is, okay? So they give you this insulin. On the day she died, she was 22 and they gave her insulin. I was with her. We had a day planned. We were gonna go shopping, we were gonna do our thing, excuse me. Uh, dang it, I was so doing so good. Uh, so, Reset here. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I went in there and they gave her the insulin and I was just like, oh, I, I knew, I had training, I knew that you weren't supposed to do that. I was like, whoa, what happened? And the, the nurse's aide at the assisting, uh, assisted living home said, I had to. I had to give it to her. It's a doctor's orders. And I, my mom's still alive. She's sitting there for this conversation. I said, just put a gun to her head. You're gonna kill her. You're gonna kill her. You don't have to do that. Do you know at 22 you don't give insulin? Do you know that? She said, yeah, but I had to. It's a doctor's order. Look, this is what I have to do each day. So checklists are a bad thing sometimes. If we can't look outside the box to know when to break a checklist, we got a whole nother problem. Do you, do you get that? I'm sure we could think of areas in here where sometimes we gotta be able to use our head. Sometimes we gotta be able to go, stop. Don't do this. So. Uh, man, what a struggle, right? It's just crazy. <clears throat> and so what I was thinking back on, reflecting on, is the fact that just, uh, I don't know, six, eight months before that, we were in the hospital. My mom was in intensive care, and they decided that they were going to uh, teach me how to give insulin. And I had to learn how to switch IV drips and all this stuff. And the trainer comes in, really cool. Mercy did a phenomenal job, by the way. Anybody that's local knows Mercy. And uh, we're going to practice on fruit, and we're going to go through all the processes, and they're going to show me. So she you know, goes to teach me, and I get out my notepad, and I start making a checklist. And she looks at me, and she goes, what do you do? I said, I'm a, I'm a mechanic. I teach, you know, instruct mechanics. She looks at my mom. She goes, you're in good hands. Mechanics, they, they never miss anything. I'm like, not in my world. <laughs> Holy cow. But this gal had a lot of faith, so I was going to take it. This is pretty cool. So, so check this out. Check this out. It's really important because I want to bring my props here. Um, she, uh, we start to count the steps out. So you're going to clean, right? You need to clean the area, and then you're going to go through, and there's this point where you dial this thing up uh, to just like two whatever cc's or whatever it is and then you purge it which purges the air out and then you reset it to the actual amount you're going to put in i look at my mom as i'm doing the checklist and i'm like i've never seen you purge it at 10 years and she looks at me she goes i didn't know you're supposed to do that she'd been giving herself insulin wrong for 10 years not enough 
And now the, the mechanic in me, because I'm really analytic, I'm really good at my job, by the way. I mean, like, really good. I'm going to brag about that. I'm going to own that, right? Like, I'm very diagnostic. And I'm sitting here and I'm picturing all the doctor's reports where her insulin wasn't, her blood sugar wasn't coming down. So what's the doctor do? The doctor orders more insulin. Well, part of it's because she's not purging it. She's skipping a step. Now, that didn't kill her. That didn't make her sick. And she was excited. I was excited because, like, if we correct this, your health is going to be better, Mom. This is a great thing. So we laugh about it. We finish things out. Kid you not. Kid you not. Next night, we're in the hospital. Young, cool, good-looking male nurse walks in in his early 20s. Hey, how you doing? I'm here to give you your insulin. I said, can I do it? I, you know, I've been wanting to poke my mom for years here, you know, and he says, hey, I can't, you know, it's safety reasons, whatnot, you know, and I said, but I just learned, I just learned how to do this. He says, I really can't. And I said, okay, that's fine. And uh, so he goes, he does his thing, he puts the insulin, psh, pops it right in. What'd he skip? Perfect. My mom's eyes got about this big. Okay, and I mean, I'm like so happy that she recognizes the step, right? Because I'm like, it was like the student interaction that we have. She got it. But you know what? This nurse didn't. He didn't get it. What else is he missing? What if it's a heart machine? What if it's a serious med? What if somebody accidentally types in the computer some nitroglycerin at some crazy number by accident, and then they just give it? What happens? You know, so my, my tension was like razor on this nurse, right? My mom says, Shane, you be nice. <laughs> as she's laying in a bed, you know, and as she's telling me to be nice, right? And I say, hey, can we talk outside? He says, yeah. We go outside and I said, hey, how you doing? Here yourself. How long you been a nurse? Six months. Where'd you graduate from? It wasn't here. <laughs> Just saying. Not that it would have mattered. Not that it would have mattered. Not that it would have mattered. I'm saying that it doesn't matter. This stuff is happening here. This stuff's happening everywhere. And I said, uh, hey, I think you're missing a step in the insulin process. I think you're missing a step. And he says to me, he says, no, I don't think so. And I said, well, can we get the head nurse just to verify? And here's what I know is this is only one tool. There's, I, when, it, there are tools in my trade that work differently to do the same task, right? I could be humble enough to understand that there might be a different tool out there that you don't have to purge it. So I want to learn because what I'm thinking is maybe the person that trained me was only talking about this brand. What if I go home and get a different brand or something? So I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to learn here. I'm going to teach myself. And uh, anyway, the head nurse comes down and, and says, you know, they tell the story and the nurse just starts yelling at this kid. He's about this big. I'm like, hey, stop. You're at fault. You're at fault. I'm at fault. As an educator, as a trainer, you hired this person six months out of college. You expect they know everything? Every nurse should know that you have to purge that. I said, Were you, did you ever miss school? Did you ever miss one day of school in two years? One day. Maybe that was the day they missed. Maybe that day they were fighting with their girlfriend. Maybe that day they were sick. Maybe their dog died. I don't know. There's a lot of maybes of why our students miss steps. We can't control it, right? There, it is impossible for us to make sure that every student gets every step, knows everything perfect. But what we can do is we can make sure to teach our students to uh, um, think about how this is just the start. This is the start of their craft, right? That's, I think that's so important that we make sure that when they leave here that they're not experts. This little uh, reader here has a, a manual. You know, how many people are honestly reading manuals to all these different pieces of electrical? You get a computer, are you reading the manual? Some? we are the majority of people? You get a printer and you start stabbing cords and you're like, I think it'll work. We use about 10% of anything's ability, right? As a professional, you don't have that choice. If I'm going to be using this tool as a professional, I need to know it. I'm not going to learn it all here. I'm going to tell you that right now. It's impossible. Okay, if I'm going to go in and use a... You know, any type of diagnostic software, anything, I'm going to have to practice and get better and better. So I think a lot of, like the deal with this nurse, he came back the next day in, in tears and plain clothes. He says, God, I wanted to be a doctor. I'm like, oh, please do. Please. That little knot you got in your stomach, we need that. You need to, we all learn from our mistakes so much. This was simple. My mom's been doing it wrong 10 years. He goes, why didn't you tell me that yesterday? I would have slept better. And I said, I don't want you. I don't want you to sleep better. I want you to toss a turn on, struggle on this for a little bit. And he said, you're such a teacher. <laughs> so, I mean, it all, it all worked out good. But 
it was definitely something where I started to pay attention. And now all of a sudden I started to think about things like, well, this affects other industries. Now I understand why I was struggling so much with mechanics when mechanics wouldn't tighten something, wouldn't check their work, wouldn't do anything. It's like if my mom couldn't get good health care and I couldn't even train a mechanic, how could I ever expect this to ever get any better? So it was this internal struggle on, you know, what do you do? So ultimately, uh, I looked at what can I do in a positive impact? How can I get people to rethink how they're doing things? And that was with checklists. This is the book. So this book uh, is really what just got me to realize how amazing the world is out there and how people in different professions. I will say this, there's two industries out there that I think they have a big head start on checklists. That's medical. There's some medical people in here, so you guys are probably extremely familiar with checklists. Would, I, would that be fair? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the other one is aviation. Aviation has been used in checklists, but out of the book here, I'm gonna share a little story here. A uh, quick version of this, when you get the actual copy of this, the link is there to the, the actual story or it's in the book itself. But 1935, uh, anybody heard of a little company called Boeing? Okay, yeah, they were about ready to be bankrupt. They were looking at selling around 200 planes to the government for the war. So these multiple manufacturers show up in this field this day. They're going to fly these planes and the winner's going to get the bid to, to fuel the war. Huge, huge, huge contract and it's going to save this company. Boeing goes up, they get this new plane, they thought it was the best technology, everything. Now, picture 1935. The plane takes off, it goes up, it's roaring, psh, crashes to the ground, burns up and in front of everybody. And the engineers and the people are like, how could this happen? How could this happen? This plane was so high tech in 1935, it was so new, it took two people to fly it. You couldn't do all the steps. You could not do all the steps required. In the middle of the flight, the pilot realized his mistake that he didn't pull a lever to release something or pull something, whatever, and it literally caused the plane to spin in a tumble and crash to the ground. Crazy, right? So what did Boeing do? Boeing went back and they were, they were like, we, this plane works, this is crazy. Boeing went back and invented, to, on the historical record they say is that this was the first known checklist in aviation. They went in there and realized that, you know, we have to do this, we have to check the flaps, we have to do this. You know all that stuff we hear when we fly that they're going around? It's fantastic. I love hearing that, by the way. I'm usually looking out the window and making sure they're doing it. You know, hey, get, do your job, do your job. Do you really check that tire pressure? <laughs> uh, so when do we, uh, this is a little thing I put in my YouTube videos a lot as a little joke, a little pausable moment to get people to think. But here's a question for you. When do we usually determine the need for a checklist? After. After. Isn't that crazy? This isn't something new. <laughs> We're making checklists that, you know, through, I bet you this goes back to the beginning of man in the caves where they accidentally set their cave on fire because they're, oh, maybe I should move the fire out a little bit, you know? Uh, it's been going on a long time, but you're absolutely right. It happens when there's a proven loss. In this uh, case here, it was with the pilot. Um, some more quotes for the book here on page eight, if you want to look at that in your little handout. There's two ways that we fail. Uh, ignorance, then ineptitude, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference between those. Ignorance is not meant to be such a negative word. I don't know, it sounds a lot worse to me. If somebody told me I was ignorant, I'd probably be a little offended. Anybody else? Uh, the way I kind of rewrote it was lack of knowledge, by, uh, not by intentional fault. So, you know, you, uh, you're driving your car, and you're new and you're supposed to pull up to a stop sign and you don't know that stop signs are meant to stop uh, and you don't apply the brakes, you get an accident, you didn't know it is what it is, right? But if you know you're supposed to stop for that stop sign and you blast right on through it, now we fall into number two. The knowledge exists, but we fail to apply it. Those, realistically, it comes down to two things. Either you know how to do something or you don't. The book does a great job and it talks about this. They say, we do not know yet as a human race how storms really work. Right? As much as we try and we try and predict the weather, it's still a guess on the best known patterns that we've seen. We don't know everything and sometimes that storm's going to come through, that tornado's going to come in and shock us because something just simply happens differently. A lot of different technologies run into that same thing, especially the not, a lot of new computer sciences, medical techniques and different things. They're so new we don't know all the questions to ask. There's heart attacks that are still happening that they have no idea why. Can't prevent it, can't do anything. Uh, Let's see here, another one. Which of those two choices is easier to forgive? Ignorance. Yeah, the lack of knowledge. You can forgive that, can't you? So the, the 20 year old kid that didn't do the needle right, you can forgive that. He need, we need some grace in those areas. If that was a 
20, 10, 20 year, you know, uh, craftsman of a nurse, I would have a very hard time forgiving that misstepped. Does that make sense? And I think we tend to carry that in our, in our work, in our life, and everything when we choose to forgive those steps. Um, let's look at some other fields. Construction, they need checklists. Yeah, absolutely. In the book, he talks a lot about another area he learned a lot about checklists was, was from the construction when they build high-rises. Here's some uh, examples. I'm going to do a fun example. These are called pistons. These are inside an engine. If you want to pass these around, just in case nobody's ever seen a piston before, you guys can just take a look at that. I watched this guy on YouTube called The Frugal Filmmaker. And so if you, if you want afterwards, you can check this out. This thing like weighs nothing, and that's what we make a lot of the videos from. Then I can get all crazy and get in there and oh, yeah. like get all professional. So um, but, <laughs> yeah. So ch check this out. Check this. <laughs> I should be recording this. <laughs> All right, check this out. So this is a cool way. My students now, don't, they don't look at my ugly face. What they're doing, instead of sitting around the table, I think the first time I saw Terry walk in, everybody was sitting in uh, lawn chairs eating popcorn in the middle of the day in the lab. And I remember the eyes getting kind of big, like, what is going on here? And I don't even look like I'm there, right? I'm off to the side, because typically now I could sit, and can you learn this way? If I wanted to teach and talk about that, you think you could see? Yeah, it's some way cool stuff. So we're going to talk about a little bit of checklist that's in my field. That's just a little extra part of the presentation. That piston in your hand. Can I get everybody stand up for a second? You've been sitting for a long time. All right. That piston that was in your hand is this right here. Okay? This part that goes up and down the engine. Everybody in here drive a car of some sort? Vehicle? At a stop sign. When you're at a stop sign, that engine's running. That piston, so hold your hand like this for me at a 90 degree, okay? That piston at a stop sign goes up and down like this. Can you do that for me? Okay, pause. That goes up and down 16 times a second. Okay, at, at a stop sign. Go ahead. Can you do that for me? Can you do 16 <laughs> times a second? <laughs> Go ahead and sit down. Hopefully you got your blood flowing a little bit. Wow, does that blow anybody's mind? 16 times a second. That is in a production vehicle, okay? That is, that is there. If one of these pieces aren't in place, is there disaster? And when this breaks, it breaks and it locks things up. You know my race bike I showed you earlier? Take a guess how many times that goes up and down a second. 320. I can't even wrap my brain around it. It hurts to try and think how that's possible. 320 times a second, hundreds of miles an hour, and it lasts for thousands of miles. The technology is that good. These, these iPhones, like how they work, it's just crazy aliens, something, right? Guys, this is all about, you know, finishing up here with the checklist and trying to get you just to think about, we take a lot of stuff for granted in other people's fields of study and, and uh, their craft, and in ours, we can't miss much. All right, a couple minutes left here, and looks like I'm not doing too bad. Uh, you guys ready to determine if you need a checklist? Has anybody decided that they still don't need them? Nobody needs to leave. <laughs> These are all really beneficial. Here's a cool student story. So you guys all probably have like lab sheets or something. And these are my directions, and these are the new ones. And notice in here, you're required, uh, no, place a check mark through each number as you complete the task. So one, two, three, so on. Well, that came a little late. I had this young lady. And she, uh, <laughs> she would check these you know, checks on her paper. And it drove me crazy. Because when I go to grade it, I own that number. You can, I'm the teacher. Are you kidding me? Like, that's mine. You can't check it off. What am I going to do now? I have no place you know, to mark it. And she, she looked at me, and she goes, OK, all right. I said, Play, quit checking your paper. You know, I, 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 I need it. It's mine. And so we're joking. And then the next day, she comes up, and she goes, Shane, I really need that. I really need that number. I really need to check it. I said, why? And she goes, because that's how I know I did it. Oh my God. I'm just like, are you kidding me? How stupid have I been all these years? I have checklists in my lab, in my file, in my curriculum right now. Every single piece of paper is a checklist. Did you do this? Yep, I did it. And the whole thing about checklists is when you agree that you can't check it until you do it, if you check it and you haven't done it yet, you're going to get yourself in trouble. 
Make sense? So we came up with a little agreement, and now what I do is I just do an X when it's wrong. What a simple solution to be able to use that. And then I started thinking, you know what? Maybe I just make all the students do this. And what I noticed was the success went up. I noticed students were finished in their labs better because now if they didn't have something checked, they'd go through and look at it before they turn in. They go, well, I don't have 14 checked. Well, it's because I don't know it. I need help. And now they come and ask for help. You know what happened before? Eh, turn it in. You know, if they bring it to me not checked, guess what? You're not done. That's an incomplete. I know that's hard. That's putting really high standards. But I'll get through it. They'll get through it. And uh, I think it's working. We talked about this about checklists by your door when you're coming and going. Uh, are checklists a, a total fix? I'm going to have to fast forward through this on time. Anybody ever heard of Evelyn McKnight, you in the medical? God, two days after my mom's passing, I went down, and anybody know what TED Talks are? I'm a huge TED Talk fan. And I got to meet Evelyn, not knowing she was there, didn't know her story. She got hep C in Nebraska. She was one of 650 people, potentially, that got hep C. And it ended up out of 650 people, 99 of them got hep C. She went through like an eight-year court battle that she would not take any money because all she wanted was the hospital to have a checklist. What was happening was there's a saline bag and the nurses were going in and reusing the same needle into a saline bag all day long. The bag would start clear, by the end of the day it would be pink, and they had to figure out how many people. Here's what's sad, okay? She started that. Her lawsuit ended, I think, in 2008. But in Nevada in 2008, one hospital, one institution had to send out 40,000 I'm sorry letters, letters, please come and let's test you to see if you have hep C. 40,000, can you imagine what it would be like get that letter? It's worse, 4,800 people in, uh, in 2014 Utah for the same thing, folks, the same thing. 200 people just February of this year at a hospital in New Jersey are getting that letter. 200 people are getting a letter. And so this, this thing, checklists don't work if people don't use them. And, this, and what, what just blows my mind, Evelyn, when she spoke and she got to the end of her, her uh, TED Talk, she was in tears going, I thought I fixed it. I thought another person would never receive that letter. Nah, it's not the case if you don't buy into it. Uh, conclusion, it's not the cure. Uh, there's no perfection in life. We're all human. Anybody in here make mistakes? Yeah, unfortunately I do too, but uh, here's, here's, my, here's my kiss off, if you will. I believe um, that we should be accountable to what we touch. Okay? I believe that we should be accountable to decisions we make that have other people's lives at, mistake, or at stake. Every person in here has that situation going in your life one way or another. Are you with me? And then uh, my little thing here is go and make it a great uh, life today, one check at a time. Thanks for coming to my presentation.